Welcome everybody on Zoom. Welcome everybody in the lecture hall. Welcome everybody from the future. So after messing up with the link, finally we are in the right location. That's uh, that's information systems for engineers. And yet today I'm not talking I'm not talking about tables. I'm going to talk about cubes, as you can see behind me. It's just another shape of data. Uh, and uh, the other shapes we'll see in uh, in big data for uh, um, for um, engineers. They have questions for you uh, before. There, let me ask you this one. Uh, share screen. There you go. So, are there SQL queries? that can be evaluated without even reading any table data from the disk. Like I give you a query and you can directly tell me the results. You don't even have to fetch the uh, the data, to, so the actual table from the disk. So the first answer is no, data always needs to be accessed. The second answer is yes, if the indices contain all the necessary information or yes, but only highly selective queries or yes, but only if the index is built on a single column. So what do you think? It sounds like magic, right? That you can just return the results without reading any data. We are divided. Now there is an emerging majority, which seems to be confirming itself. Hope we don't have too many people waiting on the other link. All right. Okay, let me tell you, there's no um, suspense because this is it. So yes, indeed, in some cases, the indices contain all the necessary information. Let me give you an example. Imagine that my query asks for all distinct values that are in a specific column. And I have an index on that, a B plus three. Who sees that you don't need the data for that? Right? Just go to, through the index, you traverse, you know, in a B plus three, you have this magic way of traversing through all the values. So you can just go through the index and that's it. That's pretty much it. And you don't even need to eliminate duplicates because in the index, it's already done. For whom is that clear? For whom is that not clear? It's okay that if it's not clear, right? Then I can just, I can just repeat. Who wants me to repeat? Okay, I'll repeat. So, you need to understand that in a relational database, there is the actual data, the data of the table that is stored uh, on the disk. Uh, and then th there is the index, so there are several indices, right? But these are additional structures in addition to the data, right? So there, you still have the data, but in addition to the data, you have the index. It's just like you have in a book, there's maybe a few hundred pages of the text of the book, and at the end, you have additional pages that contain the, uh, the words. Um, in most of the cases, very, very often, the index accelerates your query, but you still need to look at the data. For example, the index is going to tell you what records you're looking for, but then you still need to access the records from the actual data of the, of the table. But sometimes you're very, very, very lucky because it turns out that the index has all you need. Then you don't even need to look at the data. And an example of that is in the case that the query, so you write in SQL, select distinct of a specific column, and, uh, and it turns out you do have an index on that column. Then if you, if you need to know the distinct values of the attributes, you just need to, to look at the leaves of your index, right? If you, have a, if you have a B plus three, because this is where you'll find the distinct values. For whom is it clear now? Right, awesome, perfect. 
Of course, it doesn't happen every day, right? That's uh, if you're really lucky in some cases, then uh, then that can actually happen. In most cases, you do need to also access the data, but not all of the data. Um, and I have a so now it's a forward-looking question for the for what we are going to do now. So you're not supposed to know that. So this is just uh, in order to make you think. It turns out that even though cubes are not tables, we can still hit them with a hammer and force fit them into relational tables. How do you think that this happens? First, a cube is always two-dimensional, so that it's a table already. Or second, with a star schema or a snowflake schema where the dimensions metadata is outsourced to satellite tables, that's called rollup. Or three, by hitting it strongly with a hammer until it fits. Or four, it can't. These are totally different data models, and the storage layer needs to natively support cubes. That's called MOLAP. Well, now that I made the joke with the hammer and I gave the answer with the hammer, of course, it's, it's very tempting to answer this one. Ah, now. Okay. Ah, ah. There is a back and forth. Okay, let me tell you. So indeed, the correct answer is the uh, that you can. And uh, there is a way I will show you, you basically can, uh, can fit the little cubes of the data cube into a relational table and the satellite table can host the dimensions. So you can see it as a mapping. Right, it's a way of using, of abusing, so to say, a relational database in order to uh, to store cubes. So that's called Rollup. Molap actually exists. There also exists uh, database systems that can handle cubes natively without a relational table. Uh, but the reason the fourth answer is incorrect is that it says you can't. Right, so it's not that you can't; it's that you can also store it as Molap, so Molap or Rollup. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, the two are possible. Uh, a cube is always two-dimensional, so we see that, no, it can be more than two dimensions. You can have three, four, five, ten dimensions. By hitting this strongly with a hammer, technically, I could almost give points for that one because you wouldn't believe in reality what people do. Like they, 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 It's incredible. They, they have data. They don't look at the shape. They just uh, pick the database system that they already have. So in many companies, there's already a relational database license with uh, one of the big companies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people just force fit the data into that. There are also companies that think that document stores are the new cool so that you need to force fit your data in there when what they actually need is a relational table. Um, and, and in fact, in that case, it really amounts to hitting the data with a hammer because you're basically not using the right system. Uh, and uh, and uh, that creates a lot of trouble when you do this. Which brings me back to the slides because now we are going to look into the cubes. Uh, where is, okay, now, uh, share. There you go. Okay, so data cubes. So I will explain, right? I will tell you what cubes are. I will tell you the sort of things we can do with them. You will see it's different. It's not the relational algebra. It's some sort of cube algebra. So you do different things with cubes. But before, I would like to spend a bit of time on the history of everything. So you know that the starting date of modern relational databases was 1970. That is when Edgar Codd published the, 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 the paper that made history with the idea of data independence and the idea that uh, that uh, we should hide the complexity of the storage from the user and the user should just see tables and have the relational algebra and the nice query language SQL. Well, that was called the age of transactions because these relational database, they are used typically for hosting inventories and customers placing orders and so on and so on. So you keep updating the table a lot, right? If it's behind a website, if you're, if you're a web shop, then the, data, the database will get updated every time somebody orders something from your website. Um, and then in the 90s, something happened. It was the age of business intelligence. 
this is when computers started becoming powerful enough that a lot of companies realized that they could actually extract insights from their data. And this is what's called business intelligence. And it basically means that everybody in the company just reports some data, so with spreadsheets or whatever other means, and then it propagates all the way up to the C-level, the CEO, the CFO, the CTO, and so on. And they get these very fancy charts and pie charts and, uh, and, uh, and spreadsheets that have the high-level sales of the company and so on. So that was business intelligence. In fact, these are the data cubes. And the number one use case for the data cubes was exactly that. It was the sales data of the companies. Um, and finally, we have the age of big data, but big data, that's going to be the next uh, semester, big data for engineers. So we'll give you an outlook next week on, uh, on big data. So this is a bit of the history, right? 70s, the relational database systems, and 90s, that was the cubes business intelligence uh, uh, era. And it's still there today, right? It's 30 years old, but uh, people are still using that. Now I'm going to throw a few acronyms at you. Whoever saw this, OLTP OLAP, for whom does that ring a bell? Whoever heard this? Nobody? Okay. So let me tell you what they mean. Well, before I tell you what they mean, I will tell you what they are. The idea of OLTP is that it's a system like a web shop for the operating business of the company the everyday business where people update the database all the time as the company is running, right? So this is OLTP, Online Transaction Processing. OLAP is the opposite of that. OLAP is Online Analytical Processing. It's not meant for updates or, you know, constant updates and transactions. It's meant to be some frozen snapshot of the company at some point in time and you just analyze it with your fancy software to show it to the CEO, right? So this is read intensive on OLAP and write intensive on OLTP, right? These are very important words, OLTP and OLAP, because it determines what kind of systems you're going to use. Because in one case, you want to be optimized for a lot of updates, millions of customers ordering on your website. And on the other hand, for OLAP, you want to be optimized for creating fancy pie charts for the CEO suits. And here you don't care about updates. You just take a snapshot, like a photography of the, of the state of the company at a certain point in time. Then you go ahead and analyze it. And that's very different in the way that it works. Now I put a table with OLTP and a cube with OLAP. It doesn't have to be. You can also have OLAP actually with any shapes and OLTP with any shapes. But historically, people kind of think of OLTP with tables and OLAP with cubes. It kind of went this way into people's brains, right? But again, the, the one thing you should really think about is OLTP, a lot of updates, OLAP, it's read intensive, you just read the data, right? So here I'm just repeating, just to repeat what I've been saying. OLTP is really rec record keeping. It's the sales, the, 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 the orders that your customers are placing, their addresses, and so on and so on, changes all the time. So it's record keeping for running the business of the company, has to be consistent and reliable. In fact, OLTP is what we've been doing for uh, 12 weeks, right? The whole semester, I didn't call it that way, but what we've been doing is OLTP until now. Today, we are doing OLAP. And OLAP is about the decision support for the C level executives of the company. For whom is that clear? All right. And today is the OLAP day. Um, and again, to insist on that, on OLTP, you will have a lot of updates, insert, delete, update, and so on. That's the customers using your website. And OLAP is going to be a lot of reads. You're analyzing the data for the reports. Okay. All right. So on OLTP, you're really going to be looking at individual reports, right? You're, you, you, records i mean it's uh, some specific customer that uh, is ordering something you want to display a specific product to the customer uh, uh, millions of times every day but on olap what you want is summarized consolidated data that looks just like this very fancy you know these fancy colorful charts that uh, that go to the to the business people in the company all right uh, now what does it mean in terms of the sort of things that we do in the system it means that on the OLTP side, uh, you're going to have a lot of transactions on small portions of the data. That's what you've been doing for weeks, right? SQL, select from where, and so on. That's all of that. You've been doing that whenever we had the indices with the, the lookups or specific values in the table and so on. So you touch every query when you operate your website. 
many queries actually touch a very small portion of the table. It's just the product that the customer is looking for or the information of the customer placing the order and so on. But in OLAP, you typically have queries that touch all of the data. You, you take all the tables, you join them together, you aggregate all of that together. So it's very, very heavy queries that can take hours to execute, right? As opposed to for your website, milliseconds, because if, if it takes hours to display the page to the customers, they will have gone to the competition, right? So this is why it's milliseconds for running your website. But it's okay if it takes hours to generate reports, right? Typically, you need to generate the uh, the financial reports every quarter for a company. So it's okay that it takes a couple of days or even a couple of weeks to prepare these things, right? Okay. So OLTP, OLAP. Um, and that's what I've just said about the fact that OLTP should be very fast, but OLAP can be a bit slower. Um, Okay, so now in OLAP, um, a few things are going to happen that are kind of the opposite of what I've been teaching you, because you might remember that two or three weeks ago, I told you how normal forms are so great because they prevent anomalies and you don't have redundancy anymore and so on because you nicely separated into multiple tables. Well, that was true for LTP. OLTP loves normal forms and uh, we don't like redundancy, we like consistency. And in OLAP, somehow we throw everything away, all of that. Because in OLAP, we don't care about the anomalies. Why don't we care? Because the anomalies are about updating, deletion, insertion anomalies, update anomalies. But remember that in OLAP, we just want to read. We don't, we don't want to modify anything. So who cares if the data is redundant? So in OLAP, we love to just drop the normal forms and it's fine to have a single big table, you know, that's totally fine in OLAP, okay? I am not going to comment much on that. It's just as a reference for the sort of ways that you can further contrast uh, OLTP and OLAP. So you can take a look at, at this. Uh, you can, of course, ask any questions if you have, but this is more or less the, uh, the way that you can contrast them. What I told you was the most important uh, way to, uh, to contrast uh, the two, right? So you see what you have on the left shouldn't surprise you because this is really what we've seen over the entire semester. And the right side is for today. All right, so now I'm going to start going into this. So historically, as I said, OLAP was born in the 1990s and it was there to solve very specific problems. The number one problem was reporting the sales of the company by country, by department, by sector and so on, right? So it's heavily subject oriented. Um, in fact, now it extended to more. You can do web analytics. You can do the census, for example, in the US every 10 years. Uh, you can also do it for science uh, and so on and so on, right? For a customer a database, like a customer relationship management and so on. So it's subject-oriented. There's four adjectives actually that, that go with OLAP. Subject-oriented is the first one. The second one is it's, it's time variant. Because when you have um, a business running, What's important is today, you're running the business. You might still have the orders that were placed in the, the previous year or so on, but then after a while you archive, right? You, you no longer have it in your in your day-to-day -day system. Uh, you probably noticed, right, your bank on the website after two years, uh, some of the statements are no longer there. They just uh, archive them and, and they are no longer there. But in OLAP, it's different. In OLAP, you do want to see the data for the past five years, 10 years, and so on. So time is actually important in that context because you are reporting the data over multiple years. It's to make the decisions, the strategic decisions of the company. So this is what we mean with time variant is that very often you're gonna have the past five to 10 years. Um, it doesn't really go more than that because you could say, okay, what about the past 50 years or the past 100 years? The problem is that it's a pragmatic thing. In many companies, what was more than 10 years ago changed so much, the layout changed so much, and, and some of that is even still on paper. There was a, a student in continuing education who told us uh, a few years ago that um, uh, they even had uh, the, the water, uh, the, 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 the water um, pipes of the building and so on, electricity, it was still on paper, on actual paper. So typically we are pragmatic and just look at the past five, uh, to 10 years of, uh, of data. Now, what we do 
is that in order to generate that data, we have to take it from where it is. It's probably going to be in archives or in the actual relational systems of the company, of the day-to-day -day business and so on. And we need to just take a photography of that and copy it over to some place. And we're gonna analyze it from that place, right? It's called the data warehouse, that place. So there will be this step of taking the data and loading it into the data warehouse, copying it over, and then you analyze. Now, the considerations there are very practical. Imagine that you're in charge of that. You're asked by the CEO of the company to, to copy over a snapshot of the data to some place for analyzing it. It's 10 a.m., the company is running, and you connect to Postgres, and you execute a select start from where query on the system in order to copy the million of data all over to the warehouse. I guarantee you that within the hour, you're going to have angry engineers knocking at your door, telling you everything is down, it's no longer working, and so on, because you basically overloaded the whole system. So for this reason, you cannot just do it that way. And typically, it's done in the night when the business is not actually working. You basically, during the night, when it doesn't disturb anybody, you take a photography or a snapshot of the data and then move, copy it over to uh, the data warehouse. And once you've done that, it's over. You don't modify it anymore. That's it. It's frozen, and you're going to analyze it uh, where it is. There are no updates coming. You just copy it over once when you take the photograph. For whom is that clear? Right? Great. Uh, so there is a fancy word for that. It's called ETL, Extract Transform Load. So you're basically going to take a photography of not just OLTP, so not just the relational system, but maybe from the uh, customer relationship management, maybe for so for plenty of places of the company. And you're going to materialize it, to copy it over in your data warehousing. And then you can analyze, create the reports, mine if you want to use machine learning and so on. So ETL means extract, transform, load. And what I want to show you here, and the reason this slide is so overloaded, is that it is extra complicated, very complicated. In fact, there are millions of dollars that can go into that kind of projects, typically with a strategic or IT consulting company that helps you do these things. Uh, because you need to clean the data, you need to transform it a little bit, you have some complex queries to execute, and so on, and so on, and so on. I'm not going to give you the details. I'm just saying that taking that photography in order to put it in the data warehouse is absolutely not a simple, a simple thing to do. It's very complex. And extract transform load actually is such a big thing that we just say ETL, and ETL is actually a verb in English. You can really say, I'm ETLing the data into the data warehouse. You can really say that, and people will understand what you mean. And this is what you actually mean with ETL. Historically, these are the big four for uh, data warehousing, for data cubes. We have, not surprisingly, you see Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, right? These are the big three for the relational databases, plus SAP, that you probably also heard of. It's the fourth one. What happened technically is that at the, in the very early days in the 90s, um, there were a few startups that got created, SBase, Cognos, and so on. And then there was a few mergers and acquisitions that happened um, because, because the, the big companies basically saw that they needed to, there's no battery soon, uh, the big companies basically noticed that it was very important. And so basically, IBM uh, bought Cognos and Oracle bought, bought SBase. Uh, Microsoft, uh, they, they did their analytics, analysis services, and so on. So basically, now all of them have it. So it's very common to have the data warehousing together with the relational database management system. You really have this as a, as a single product. And it will become very clear why this is very often packaged with a relational database, even though you could think that's something different, right? From a, Relational database, here it is. So these are the big four of data warehousing. And after this introduction, I'm going to go into the model. Now, just like we've done with relational tables, I'm going to be introducing cubes to you, right? I'm not going to do it with math, don't worry. It's not going to be uh, as much math, math as we did. What is a cube? This is a cube. In that example with three dimensions, think of a Rub Rubik's cube. You've always, you, you've all seen these kind of things. And basically the idea of a cube is that there are dimensions like this, for example, the years, the products, uh, server, TV, phone, and so on, and the country, Switzerland, Austria, 
Germany, and so on. And basically, this gives you coordinates in the cube, and then you have these super little cubes there that contain one value. For example, uh, at the place that is colored in yellow, you know that you are in the year 2022. This is the server product and the country, this is Switzerland, and maybe this would be Austria, and maybe this would be Germany, right? So we basically organize these values, and this is seven. In that case, there are seven. It means seven servers were sold in Switzerland in 2022. And you have a value like that in every little cube like that. It's just nicely organized by year, by product, and by country. For whom is that here? Right? So this is how you organize it. Now, here I put three dimensions, but it can be four, five, six. There can be more dimensions. I just put three because this is what we commonly think of, right? But you could imagine that we also have as dimensions the salespersons and so on and so on, right? Okay. So these dimensions of the cube, year, product, country, they're extremely important, right? Some people also call them axes, the axes of the cube. Um, so you can have where, a geography dimension, you can have a who, the salespersons, for example, you can have what, the servers, the TVs, the phone, when, 2022, 2023, maybe the quarters, which currency, maybe you separate in dollars, euros, Swiss francs, uh, and so on. Okay, so these are the dimensions, and they are absolutely important in, uh, in cubes. Now, here's the thing. I managed to do this in three dimensions to get my point across, four, five, forget it. Now, uh, most of us cannot really deal with that so easily. We are good at reading pages, right? Looking at a screen, reading pages, and there's only two dimensions on a screen or on a page, and that we are really good at. So what we do with the cubes is that instead of looking at the cubes like that, uh, we like to display them in two dimensions, and what we do is we have a facts table. So you have to imagine that these little cubes, you disassemble the cube, right? You completely disassemble it, you get all these little cubes, and then you nicely pile them on top of each other, and you get that. Every record here is a little cube. The first row is the little cube for Germany 2022, Peter, and the value inside is $1,000, and you get the second cube, the third cube, so every row of that table is a little cube in that view. This is the same. This is just a two-dimensional list of the little cubes, as opposed to the fancy uh, cube display that, again, with more than four, three dimensions, it's very difficult. But here, what happens if we have more dimensions? It's not a problem. We just have more columns, right? Who understands? Okay, that's called the fact table. This is a fact table. We list the little cubes, the values, one on every row. So basically, we have every attribute here, every column is a dimension, except the last one. The last one is not a dimension, it's the actual value that there is in the little cube. Okay, now uh, some people like to also add this, especially in business reporting for the financial report, for example, in the US, they add, they add these uh, square brackets uh, to clarify what is a dimension, what is a, a value of a dimension, and so on. So axis is what they call a dimension, member is what they call a possible value for a dimension, and then at the, on the right, we have the value. It's just very often you will see that uh, if you're involved in, uh, in uh, business reporting. All right. A lot of countries are adopting actually this, uh, this, uh, this terminology. Okay. So now what do we do with cubes? With tables, we can select, we can project, we can aggregate, we can order, and so on. That's the relational algebra. But this is for tables. So cubes is going to be different, right? We're going to be doing other things. So let me tell you what we have for cubes. The first thing we can do with a cube is to slice. We can slice the cube. Just means that I take one level of the cube and I just take it out of the cube, right? Just like this, what's happening here. It's a slice of the cube. You can actually, I, I, I love to compare it with uh, taking some wedding cake and, uh, you know, just cutting it into the pieces like this. In fact, a few years ago, I actually came with, uh, with uh, 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 some bread that was shaped. I went to the bakery and I asked, do you have a cube shaped piece of bread? They told me, yes, we have that. Okay, I took it. And I, I came to, uh, to the lecture with, uh, with the bread and with a knife and, uh, and, and, and I should, uh, I'm not going to do this every year, but this is just so that you can visualize the things. And so taking a slice is really something that you do like this. So technically, 
if you start with this and you take a slice, in that case, I took the slice Switzerland, right? So it might be that the, the, what I'm extracting right here is Switzerland, above that could be Germany, uh, below France and Austria, for example, right? So if I'm taking the slice, what I do is I extract only these records that have Switzerland. What was that from a, a relational perspective? If you look at this as a table, what did I just do on the table? What is that called? Going from here to here in the relational algebra. Was it a projection? Was it? That's the selection, exactly. This is a selection. So what we've just established is just that slicing a cube like that, if I look at the fact table, it's in fact a selection on the facts table, right? The slicing a cube is a selection on the fact table. For whom is that here? Right? I just select th those little cubes that match my the level that I'm. Okay, now we can do something else. Uh, we can start displaying it because, of course, this is nice, right? But there's even a better way that these business people love because this is not quite business ready yet, this way of looking at things. Um, business people prefer that kind of things, right? So what they have is first when they slice. So here I sliced on Switzerland and you also notice that the currency that's also just USD. So what we do is that we take these away from the table, Switzerland and USD, and I put it up there. See, location, Switzerland, currency, USD. This is what I slice on. And then I only keep down there what I did not slice on, right? Period, salespersons, and value. And you just know by looking at this view on the top that we sliced on Switzerland and USD. Now we are not quite there yet. This is kind of looking nice, but we can make it look even nicer. Right? And the way we make it look even nicer is by reorganizing these four values, 5,000, 6,000, and, and so on, like this. So we're going to have now a two-dimensional grid because there are only two dimensions left, period and salesperson. So now I can display them like this, like Peter and Mary are going to be my rows, 2021, 2022 are going to be my columns. And now I can put nicely my 7,000, 5,000, 8,000, 6,000. It's the same thing, right? It's just a different display. This is called dicing, dicing, right? So I take my little values, I have only two dimensions left, and I dice putting the salespersons on the rows, the years on the columns, and then I put my little cubes or my little values in the two dimensional grids. This is also called, so it's dicing, this fancy view that business people love is called the cross tabulated view. It's the fancy name for that. For whom is that clear, right? Okay, so you see, we had this, so the original thing is the cube, right? Then we have this fact table equivalent. We can slice, putting up there the slice dimensions, and then we can cross tabulate by dicing. And what we say is that we slice on the location and the currency, and we dice salesperson on the row and the year on the column. You can typically only dice two dimensions, two dimensions. That's only because there's two dimensions for the paper you could technically dice a third dimension. And in fact, spreadsheets have that. You can dice with a third dimension. You would just have tabs or sheets, right, for the third dimension. You would just need to, to click at the bottom like you have in, in spreadsheet software, separate sheets. But it's a bit less common. Typically, when you dice, it's just two dimensions. Okay. And now if you go like the international business reporting, the way it's done, it's called XBRL. It looks like this. You have this fancy way of using the colors, the dark and light version. Uh, it can be done purple, blue, whatever. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And uh, you have the uh, you have the um, uh, the nice business friendly view. Now, as I said, typically when you dice, it's going to be usually two dimensions: one on the rows, one on the columns. Could be one, then you just have some vertical. Uh, arrangement or some horizontal arrangement instead of uh, a grid. Three, again, you could do if you use these sheets and these little tabs that you can click on at the bottom of the, of the display in your user interface. But again, typically it's going to be two. And the rest you're going to have to slice on. So you're selecting specifically Switzerland, dollars and so on, right? So again, the slicers are up there. This is everything I slice on, there could be more. And when I dice, I put one on the rows and one on the column, right? All right. So you see that 
doing that, there are many ways you can slice and dice, right? You can actually interact with that view. And typically, if you have software like this, you can, with your mouse, you can drag and drop the, the axis. For example, you could take salespersons, drag and drop it to the slicing area. Then you can take currency and drag and drop it to the rows and so on. And you can rearrange the view. It's interactive, right? You can really play with this. Who has already done it and is familiar with that? Whoever saw the pivot table function of, let's say, Excel, Microsoft Excel, that's the pivot table. That's the same thing. So if you haven't done that already, it probably also work with LibreOffice and the others. Try to, you, you need to put that something like that, copy paste it, take it, put, copy paste it into your favorite spreadsheet software. Then you select it and you click in the menu, create pivot table, right? And once you do that, you can create that in the spreadsheet software, just by drag and drop it, your dimensions into the system. Really try it, it's super easy to do, business people do it, right? So it's, it's really something very common, um, this slicing and dicing. There's no better way to learn than to do, really do it yourself uh, in, uh, in Excel. You can do it with the exercises when we give you facts tables, put them in some spreadsheet software and use the pivot table to create these views. Very instructive. Okay, uh, all right, and there are more things that we can do, and you can also do it with the pivot table, you can also do it with Excel, it's aggregations. So what are aggregations uh, in the context of data cubes? It's the idea, I'm not sure if you see what's going on here. Here we have these, uh, these uh, slices, you know, that, that go in the depth of the screen, so let's, let's imagine that Switzerland, that's Germany, that's Austria in the back. Now we merge them, you see? Now there's no more separation. So what I do when I want to aggregate is, let's say that I want to sum Germany plus Switzerland plus Austria, but I still want to do it for every product and for every year, right? So I'm only aggregating like this. I could, of course, also aggregate like this or aggregate like this, right? It's just a choice. But in that case, I'm aggregating like this. This is called an aggregation. Let's do it as an example. So imagine I have this facts table. And what I'm going to do is aggregate like this. For example, I'm going to keep my periods and salespersons and, and currency and so on. But I want to aggregate through the countries. I want to add Germany plus Switzerland and call it worldwide. Well, if my business is only in Germany and Switzerland, then this is technically worldwide, right? So Germany plus Switzerland. So the yellow with the yellow, the red with the red, the purple with the purple and the green with the green, right? So I'm going to be use, adding 1,000 plus 5,000. I'm going to be adding 2,000 plus 6,000 and then 3 plus 7,000 and 4 plus 8,000. Who is following me? And this is what we get. So now I put world again, if I assume my business is just Germany, Switzerland, I can do that, right? So now the whole world and look at this one plus five gives me six, right? So for 2022 Peter USD, I get six, one plus five, two plus six gives me eight for uh, Mary. Uh, 10 is three plus seven, right? So now I get that for 2021 Peter and 12 is uh, four plus eight. That's for 2020. Uh, that's for, uh, yes, 2021, Mary, all right? Who would be able, if I give you different numbers in there, who could construct that? Awesome. So you just need to add and aggregate. And technically, this is what we've done. We've just merged some of the records and summed them up. You can also do it with Excel or with a spreadsheet software. You can also do that. It, it even tells you, you can do the sum, the average, the count, it even lets you choose how you want to aggregate. It's super easy to do. You don't even need to write any code for that. Now, if you want to your fancy view, coming back to this, once you have aggregated, what's going to happen, the way you see that you aggregate it, is that now in the slicing area, you can see it's no longer written Switzerland, it's written world. And world is kind of everything. It's all of my locations together. So when I see world, I know that I aggregate it through all of my locations, right? And then I can display, and I see, you see this is our, these aggregated numbers, nicely displayed. This is dicing on salespersons and domain, aggregating on, on location, 
and slicing on currency USD. Now, what we love to do too, is to add these totals like this, right? I can also aggregate, but just adding the total. So I could add a third row in there, that is my whole domain, so all salespersons, and I'm summing 10 plus 12 is 22, 6 plus 8 is 14, 6 is 16 plus 20 is 36. Now, let me tell you what happens. So this is for the rows. For the rows, it's probably easy, right? For the rows, I just added a third row, and I'm summing through every row. What happened with my third column? Well, I did the same, but summing over the columns, right? So I have basically uh, 10 plus 6 gives me 16, 12 plus 8 gives me 20, and 22 plus 14 gives me 36. And this is both the sum of that and the sum of that, right? I just sum like this. Now look at what happening, what's happening here. I have this L shape right here. And this is how you see on the columns that you have a total. Technically, this is the domain of all the times here, 21, 22. So technically the domain is up there. But since you aggregate them, you're going to have this L shape here to basically have the aggregation here. So this here, you see the, this little cell has an L shape here to basically means that this is where it appears, the aggregation. Who understands this? All right. And technically, the idea is that you have some hierarchy in there. You have all times that is the parent of 2122, all salesperson that is the parent of Peter and Mary, and world that is the parent of Germany and Switzerland, right? So you see like this, you have the dimension, the domain, and then the hierarchy of members. In fact, if you consider the world, you can even have multiple levels here. You can have the world with Europe, Asia, Africa, America, and so on. In Europe, Switzerland, and then even the cantons, maybe even the Gemeinde, uh, and so on and so on, right? So you can have a whole hierarchy in the dimensions. This idea that you have hierarchies in cubes is very important in the data cubes and the data warehouses. And you can do a lot of super fancy things thanks to the hierarchies. And in fact, with a whole, so here it was a simple flat hierarchy with just all times and then like, like this, right? It's flat. What about this? How do you display this in the columns? Well, this is how it looks like. Who finds this beautiful? I love that. I find it beautiful. It has the L shapes and so on. So you see you have Zurich, Geneva, Interlaken, then you have Switzerland like this, that totals here. Then you have Berlin, Frankfurt, Germany, like these nice L shapes with the total here. Then you have Europe, that is basically all of that. And again, with the L shape, you make clear that this is the total. Then you do the same thing with Asia. I just put India and China here. Then the whole world comes as an L shape. So you see this nesting of L shapes that gives you this nice aggregation on multiple levels, right? OK, so this is for the columns, right? If you aggregate on the columns, then you use these L shapes. Now you could think, OK, for the rows, I could also use L shapes, right? Uh, but in fact, that's not really what people do. When it's on the rows, you use indentation instead in order to characterize, right? So you see that I have Zurich, Geneva, Interlaken indented in the same way, Switzerland and Germany on the same level and so on. In fact, imagine as an accountant, you want to do a balance sheet or an income statement. Maybe some of you were in student associations, right? So you have to do these things. You have to do the accounting with balance sheets and so on. Well, in your balance sheet, you're not going to be putting L shapes everywhere, right? You're going to be using indentation like this when you do it. It's even in the yearly report of ETH, there's this kind of tables there, okay? So for the columns, I can use the L shapes. For the rows, I can use the indentations. But you see that this is super fancy. It's very, very, very nice views that you can build. And all of that we did out of the data queue. Who is with me? Okay. It's very visual. This is what I really like about this. About this. Uh, we are about to have the break. So I'm just, uh, just as a cliffhanger before we go to the break, I'm going to be doing something magic. It's called a roll-up. Imagine that in my user interface, it's interactive. I don't want the cantons or the cities. I want to roll up one level, click, there you go. See, it disappeared, now I rolled up. What if I don't want to see the countries, just the continents, there, there you go. What if I just want the whole world? I can roll up again. The other direction is called drilling down. I'm drilling down into more details or I'm rolling up, removing the details. Drill down, roll up, okay? So I'll see you in 15 minutes for the continuation of this.